In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Welcome, friends, to Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast. I think we're on episode 90, a legal podcast. Not political, just legal commentary. We don't talk about politics on this program at all. So please don't ban us from YouTube and give me back my blue check mark. It's the official podcast of the Invictus Law Firm PA, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida. The website for which is AugustusInvictus.com, and that is me, yours truly, the host of this program. We're simulcasting to YouTube and Twitter. You should go to Emperor Invictus on Twitter. Of course, I forgot all of the links to plug because I do every time. Even though my bookkeeper is sitting right across from me and didn't say a word about it. There is the website. Yep, I'm going to blame everything on you today. Even though I do this every single week. (laughs) Uh, Let's get the viral style so you can send us some delicious t-shirt money. There we go. It's in the chat. Top, short, long, bottom. Arete. Brian, good morning from the west. Good morning from the east, buddy. Florida Treasure, greetings Augustus. Sunny day full of uh, hope here in Orlando. It is a nice sunny day here in Orlando. I agree. Florida Treasure, why uh, have we never met? Why have you never emailed me? Let's uh, let's go to coffee. Let's get coffee. Whatever people say these days, I don't know. Anyway, those are all the plugs. Let's read the news, shall we? Um, I believe that today's show has the worst title I've ever made for anything. Uh, An essay I've written, an article I've written, a book I've written, a podcast I've done, anything I've ever done in my life, the title Martial Law, Insurrection, and Vicarious Liability for Parents is obviously a rush job I did not think about, but it is very descriptive of the news we are going to read today. Because we're going to start with what's going on in New York, the surveillance and police state that has been established there by the governor. We're going to talk about the Trump case. I wanted to dedicate this whole show to the Trump case, the Supreme Court, you know, denying this whole nonsense from Colorado. But it turns out the Supreme Court opinion is actually really boring and it's just not fit for radio. And then I want to talk about, uh, what's the other thing? Who is this? Oh, DEI. Yeah, so <laughs> the counter-revolution in Florida where all the university freaking parasites are being fired because of the Florida law. Um, Contrast that with what is going on in Britain, uh, in the case of Sam Malia. But then the rest of the title having to do with vicarious liability for parents has to do with a case in Michigan where the parents of a school shooter are on trial for manslaughter. Absolutely unheard of. You should be very concerned about it. Uh, I don't think anything like this could ever happen in Florida. Well, not ever. Couldn't happen in Florida under our present system with DeSantis, but this is going to set the pattern for all prosecutors everywhere. Kind of like J6 emboldened uh, these prosecutors in Charlottesville to pull off the same national dragnet, you know, public spectacle nonsense. Like, this thing in Michigan is going to be picked up by other states. That is my prediction. Uh, Florida Treasure says, I emailed your Patreon account many months ago. Florida Treasure, I have no idea. I don't think I have a Patreon account. I'm banned from Patreon. So whoever's pretending to be me on Patreon is taking all of my delicious t-shirt money. So please uh, give me that link so I can report them. But my ProtonMail.com account is in the uh, description, the YouTube description. Uh, Go ahead and email me there. So, uh, note, that is a demand letter. Hold on. Hold on. That's the... Where is the bloody news? I got too many windows open today. All right. First of all, like I said, go to Emperor Invictus on Twitter because that's where all this news is posted anyway. Let's um, see if we can listen to this. It should come through as audio at least. It is a video of the governor of New York, but... No, hold on. Oh, Point sh- one. Sh- start over. There Point you go. one. I'm redeploying nearly 1,000 members of the New York State Police 
MTA police and MTA National Guard to conduct bag checks in the city's busiest transits. They'll start seeing them at the tables, making sure that weapons are not being brought in, working in, in concert with our New York State Police as well as our NYPD. Because no one heading to their job or to visit family or to go to a doctor appointment should worry that the person sitting next to them possesses a deadly weapon. Point. So that's the governor of New York explaining that she is deploying uh, National Guardsmen along with state police to guard the subways and check bags. What an incredible development. After New York City has been flooded with countless illegal immigrants in the past several months, as we've seen all over the news, they've now uh, deployed the military in New York City. What an interesting strategy, interesting development they've got going on there. So I wanted to uh, juxtapose to that, read you this article about something else the governor is doing. These two things in tandem should concern everybody, at least if you're in New York. Uh, I guess it doesn't really affect the rest of us, but New York has now become this dystopian surveillance state and police state. So this is from uh, Standing for Freedom Center. Honestly, I've never heard of Standing for Freedom Center. Sounds conservative libertarian to me. I don't know. I'm not endorsing the place. I don't know who these guys are. But this article is worth, uh, worth reading it. It's titled, New York Announces It Will Take Citizen Surveillance and Censorship to the Next Level. And this is actually from November of 2023. So this is right around the time or right before all of these illegal immigrants started flooding into New York City. This is what happened. Like the plot to a dystopian movie, New York will now monitor social media writings, collect data, and use law enforcement to crack down on any expression it deems to be hate speech. Now, like I said, this is not going to affect us. This should be concerning to people in New York. However, like many things in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or D.C., those things that happen in the cities eventually do come out to where we are, right? So it is something to keep an eye on because these are the people guiding the ship. And they're steering the whole ship of America. New York Kathy... Uh, excuse me, New York Governor Kathy Hochul, Democrat, announced on Monday that the state will ramp up. That's Monday back in November. Okay, I think that was November 17th. That means that Monday was November 13th. Uh, ramp up surveillance efforts of social media accounts and that law enforcement will take proactive measures, including contacting people on suspicion of using hate speech. Hochul cited the rise in anti-Semitic activity in New York and especially New York City where the world's largest population of Jews outside of Israel resides. Hochul also mentioned that Islamophobic incidents, which she claimed were increasing and going underreported. Hmm. The governor said she would also be increasing police presence, which she stated has been focused on protecting potential targets, including synagogues and yeshivas and mosques and any other place that could be susceptible to hate crimes or violence. So, what is the stated reasoning of deploying the National Guard this week? Heaven knows. But the stated reasoning back in November is that the increased police presence is going to be to protect Jews and Muslims and their places of worship. As part of that, Hochul explained, quote, We're very focused on the data we're collecting from surveillance efforts, what's being said on social media platforms. And we have launched an effort to be able to counter some of the negativity and reach out to people when we see hate speech being spoken about on online forums. Our media analysis, our social media analysis unit, has ramped up its monitoring of sites to catch incitement to violence, direct threats to others. And all this is in response to our desire, our strong commitment to ensure that not only do New Yorkers be safe, seek, right? I didn't make that grammatical error. She did. But they also feel safe because personal security is about everything for them, whatever that means, end quote. She stated that uh, everyone must work together, adding, quote, if anyone thinks that they can get away with spreading hate and harming other New Yorkers and violating the law, you will be caught. Matthew, I see that you're calling me now, but I'm live on Crime and Punishment. 
Uh, I will have to call you back. Uh, she stated, uh, yeah, if anybody thinks they can get away with spreading hate and harming other New Yorkers and violating the law, you will be caught. You will be caught here in the state of New York because we are ramping up our resources to ensure that everyone can live freely. Except you, of course, because you are haters. We have been involved in this. We'll protect protected speech. We will not protect people committing hate crimes. Not here in Manhattan, not in any borough, not in any one of the 62 counties, not on college campus, not in a house of worship. Wow. Tough words from a strong leader. She told the media that the state had already, quote, increased our capacities for surveillance as well as responding to terrorist threats in the aftermath of the Buffalo massacre that occurred on May 14th, 2022, end quote. Hochul's plans drew criticism from some who called the effort unconstitutional and totalitarian. Hmm. Why would anybody call it that? Robbie Starbuck, who hosts a podcast, posted on X. I don't know what the podcast is called. Uh, anyway, posted on X, quote, Democrat New York Governor Kathy Hochul says that her team is, quote, collecting data from surveillance efforts on social media to combat hate speech so people feel safe. These are all in quotes, by the way, all these phrases. She might as well tear up our Constitution. It would be a faster way to get the point across that she's violating it, end quote. Last month, Hochul and New York City Mayor Eric Adams demanded that social media platforms monitor speech and shut down incitements to violence, with Adams insisting, quote, these guys are experts. If they don't want to do their job of policing themselves, I really believe it's time for the federal government to step in, end quote. So, governor of New York and the New York City mayor are saying, look, we need the feds to come in here and regulate speech that we don't like. Because if we can't get these people under control and stop them from talking about immigrants and Muslims and Jews, the feds have got to come in here and do it. Not dystopian at all, by the way. This is totally constitutional... The calls come as Europe ramps up censorship of alleged hate speech, including pressuring ex-owner Elon Musk to censor the posts of online users. Maybe that's why my blue checkmark was taken away. I don't know. Many European nations now have laws that have made the expression of religious beliefs to be viewed as banned speech. This week, Finnish Member of Parliament Paivi Rasenin, if I don't know how to speak Finnish to be quite honest, and a Lutheran bishop, were acquitted after four years of trials and investigations simply for sharing the biblical view on marriage and sexuality. And in the UK, an army veteran will soon be tried for silently praying for his deceased son outside of an abortion clinic. Just unbelievably hateful. In the US, politicians have demanded internet censorship and have even engaged in it themselves. For example, the Supreme Court will hear Missouri v. Biden, a case which has shown that the federal government coerced social media platforms to censor content it disagreed with, even if the content was true. And as we know, that is in the bag. It's history. We now have, this is not in the article, but we now have two cases, one from Florida and one from Texas, joined at the hip before the Supreme Court for the laws that we passed here and in Texas to uh, stop X and Facebook uh, and so forth from censoring conservative speech. The opinion hasn't come out yet, but it seems to be the going consensus that they are hostile to these laws. And the laws of Florida and Texas are not going to be upheld. And that X and Facebook will be given a free pass to continue censoring everybody. So we'll see when that opinion comes out. We'll probably cover that on this program. To continue with this article, though, Jonathan Turley, a constitutional law professor at George Washington University and free speech advocate who has written extensively on the issues of censorship and limitations on speech, has cautioned the U.S. against adopting European censorship laws that allow governments to stop people from saying things that governments oppose. (laughs) Which is kind of why we have a constitution here, right? and the Bill of Rights, and the First Amendment specifically, that is exactly why we passed it, was so that we wouldn't do what they did in Europe. And here we are. Despite what many think, hate speech, which is subjective, is protected both by the Constitution and by Supreme Court precedent, according to Turley. He wrote, quote, 
There have been calls to ban hate speech for years. Even former journalist and Obama State Department official Richard Stengel has insisted that while the First Amendment protects the thought that we hate, it should not protect hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. In an age when everyone has a megaphone, megaphone, that seems like a design flaw. Actually, it was not a design flaw, but the very essence of the framers' framework for a free society. The First Amendment does not distinguish between types of speech, clearly stating, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Referencing, that's the end quote, that's all Turley's speech there. Back to the article writer. Referencing some of the many cases upholding the right to speech considered to be hate speech, Turley wrote that, quote, while the Supreme Court has allowed limited exceptions, it does not bestow on the government the open right to strip protection of speech because it is deemed hateful, end quote. <laughs> well, when law professors meet the real world, they get to the FO phase of FAFO. Because these people making these laws, they're not law professors, and they don't care about the Constitution. That's why we have a Supreme Court, is to set those people straight. But now you have those same people, just happen to be liberals, I'm sure there's nothing, that's just a coincidence, uh, trying to restrict now the Supreme Court or say, we should just, aban uh, just abolish the whole thing. We don't even need the Supreme Court. Because, as we discussed, I think, two episodes before... Liberals are now finding out that, um, you know, the Supreme Court doesn't have to go your way. And there are political considerations. It's just, it's been in your favor for the past 70 years or so. Anyway, he cited Brandenburg, Brandenburg, excuse me, v. Ohio, a 1969 case involving violent speech, wherein the Supreme Court struck down an Ohio law prohibiting public speech that was deemed as promoting illegal conduct specifically ruling for the right of the Ku Klux Klan to speak out, even though it is a hateful organization. So in other words, even under this liberal regime from 1950 to, you know, two years ago, um, even under that regime, the Supreme Court still said, yeah, you still have the right to speak, even though we hate you and you're a hateful organization of evil white supremacist hate mongers. They still have the right to speak, man. That's the First Amendment. And we've had that forever, so it's not like this is anything new. Turley also noted that in the 2011 case of RAVV City of St. Paul, the court struck down a ban on any symbol that arouses anger, alarm, or resentment in others on the basis of race, color, creed, religion, or gender. And in Snyder v. Phelps, also in 2011, the court said that the hateful protests of Westboro Baptist Church were protected. So all these new laws about, uh, we got to ban the swastika, because it is implicitly hate speech. Not only that, it is implicitly intimidation. It's implicitly a threat of violence to fly a swastika. That's exactly what the Supreme Court is saying. You cannot do that. They've said it as recently as 2011, but it goes all the way back to the KKK case, uh, cases. KKK cases. So this is long-standing Supreme Court law long-standing constitutional law, long-standing First Amendment law that they're now trying to overturn by saying, well, these symbols are inherently hateful. They're inherently uh, symbols of violence. They're inherently threats of violence. So we have to outlaw them. That's not just New York City where Hochul has made this surveillance slash police state. That's everywhere. That's here in Florida. We have a case like that that is live right now. Under HB 269, they've now done this whole thing where, well, if you're <laughs> flying swastika flags, that's a threat of violence. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not by any constitutional standard whatsoever. It's First Amendment protected free speech. But this is the way America is going. It's going toward that European ideal of let's just ban everything we don't like. Let's just ban all this hate speech. Anything we don't like is hate speech. You don't like mass immigration? Hate speech. Can't allow it. Don't like what's happening at the border? Hate speech. You just hate Latin Americans. Don't like Islamic terrorism? Hate speech. 
You just hate Muslims. Can't mention another group. Let's move on to the Supreme Court case, right? Supreme Court rules that states can't kick Trump off the ballot. Interestingly, I got this from Greenwald. I thought it was his own article. He's quoting NBC News. I don't want to read NBC News, but we're going to because Glenn Greenwald is the one who retweeted it. Supreme Court rules states can't kick Trump off the ballot. Uh, The decision swiftly ended the legal fight over whether states can bar Trump from their ballots based on the Constitution's 14th Amendment. Like I said, I was going to read this opinion on the program today. I just devoted all to that, but it turns out it's really boring. It's just common sense. Let's read the article. The Supreme Court on Monday handed a sweeping win. Guy can't stop winning. I know Trump said we're going to win so much, we're going to get tired of it, but I'm not tired of it yet. I love winning. The Supreme Court on Monday handed a sweeping win to former President Donald Trump by ruling that states cannot kick him off the ballot over his actions leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol, bringing a swift end to a case with huge implications for the 2024 election. Yeah. Like, you know, the incumbent president can't uh, put his opponent in prison and stop the election from happening. (laughs) Yeah, that's or the the, the incumbent uh, president can't kick his opponent off the ballot to stop the election from happening. Those are huge implications. Third world stuff, man. And an unsigned ruling with no dissents, only concurrences, by the way. And an unsigned ruling with no dissents, the court reversed the Colorado Supreme Court which had determined that Trump could not serve again as president under Section 3 of the Constitution's 14th Amendment. The provision prohibits those who previously held government positions but later engaged in insurrection from running for various offices. Now, it doesn't doesn't get uh, into the history of this here, but so let me tell you, that entire thing was passed because of the actual civil war that we had. Right? 1861 to 65. There were members of Congress. Jefferson Davis was one of them. There were members of Congress who left Congress. Members of the Union Army. uh, The Union Army. the, The American Army. Who left the Army to go home to the South and start the Confederate government. And the Confederate States of America, the Confederate Army, so on and so forth. Those people engaged in a war with the United States and lost. Sucks, but they lost. And then, in a pretty wise move, if you ask me, at least for any conqueror, this would be a wise move, they said... Uh, all of you who took up arms against us, you are not allowed to have any government positions. Seems like a no-brainer. Southerner or not, that's an obvious thing to do if you have just conquered a bunch of people. You don't let them then take office in the government they were just fighting against. Like, Be as Southern as you want, you have to admit that's a common sense thing to do. (laughs) But to be used 150 years later... To say that, well, this guy said some inflammatory things and a riot started and uh, he can't be president because that's an insurrection. That's insanity. That has nothing to do with why this thing was passed. It's obviously not the intent of this little clause in the amendment. And like I said, the Supreme Court opinion is straight up boring because it's just so common sense. But that's the history of it, right? The court said that the Colorado Supreme Court had wrongly assumed that states can determine whether a presidential candidate or other candidate for federal office is ineligible. I think it was Roberts who, in the oral arguments, asked a supremely enlightening question, which, again, Southerner or not, you have to admit, was a darn good question. He said, wasn't the whole point of this amendment to restrict state power? So why would we allow the states to remove someone from a federal election 
<laughs> and, and determine that the guy they don't like can't run for president. There's no answer to that. Like the, the very people who cry every single day that the South fought a war are now using this state sovereignty argument to say, yeah, we're a state, we can say that we don't like Donald Trump and we don't want him to be on the ballot because we don't want him to be president. Because he engaged in the insurrection, this mythical fantasy insurrection, it's such an ironic argument. And again, there's no answer for it. The ruling makes it clear that Congress, not states, has to set rules on how the 14th Amendment provision can be enforced against federal office seekers. As such, the decision applies to all states, not just Colorado. States retain the power to bar people running for state office from appearing on the ballot under Section 3. So if Trump ever runs for governor of California, California can certainly uh, do that if they want. But you can't affect a national election. Who was it? Sotomayor? Um, Asking, well, why should Colorado... And this is a leftist on the Supreme Court. Why should Colorado get to determine who the people in Michigan can vote for for president? That just doesn't seem right. And obviously it's not right. Quote, because the Constitution makes Congress rather than the states responsible for enforcing Section 3 against all federal office holders and candidates, we reverse, end quote, the ruling said. I mean, imagine if, like Florida, a Confederate state, after the Civil War, had said, you know what? We don't like Andrew Johnson. <laughs> you know, he engaged in insurrection when he took over the presidency. Or whatever retarded argument could be made. Just like Trump, you know, on January 6th created an insurrection. What a retarded argument. But Florida could have made a retarded argument and said with a straight face, we don't want Johnson to be president. We're taking him off the ballot. How would these liberals feel then? What if, you know, Florida said later on, um, we don't like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We want to remove him from, and maybe it's not the insurrection clause. Maybe it's something else in the Constitution because of all the unconstitutional things that FDR did. We're going to remove him from the ballot in Florida. I mean, that's unthinkable. It's stupid. Obviously, the liberals would be up in arms about it. New Yorkers would be up in arms about it because FDR was from New York. The ruling... Oh, we already read that part. Uh, By deciding the case on that legal question, whether it's Congress or the states who can enforce Section 3, the court avoided any analysis or determination of whether Trump's actions actually constituted an insurrection. So they just sidestepped that whole thing. Right? That's not even an issue before the court, whether that was an insurrection or not. The decision comes just a day before the Colorado primary, which was two days ago, Super Tuesday. Minutes after the ruling, Trump hailed the decision in an all capital letters post from his social media site writing, Big Win for America. It is, really. In addition to ensuring that Trump remains on the ballot... In Colorado, the decision will end similar cases that have arisen. So far, only two other states, Maine and Illinois, followed Colorado's path. Like the Colorado ruling, both those decisions were put on hold. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold registered disappointment with the decision in an interview with NBC News' Katie Turr on MSNBC. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold said to Katie Turr, quote, Ultimately, this decision leaves open the door for Congress to act to pass authorizing legislation. But we know that Congress is a nearly non-functioning body, so ultimately it will be up to the American voters to save our democracy in November, she said. Wow. Yeah, it's too bad they couldn't save democracy by kicking off their opponent from the ballots. That's terrible. Well, maybe they can still save democracy by imprisoning the president's lead opponent, that would help. And do that in where? Venezuela and where whatever third world crap holes they're basing this off of. Maine Secretary of State Shana Bellows was quick to act after the ruling. Quote, I hereby withdraw my determination that Mr. Trump's primary petition is invalid. End quote. She said in a statement citing her obligation to follow the law. Well, good for her. That's the right thing to do. 
Credit to her. Kudos. The Supreme Court decision removes one avenue to holding Trump accountable for his role. This is NBC News, by the way, which is why it's surprising that Glenn Greenwald posted this on Twitter. Why would, he, why would you do that, Glenn? Uh, the Supreme Court decision removes one avenue to holding Trump accountable for his role in challenging the 2020 election results, including his exhortation that his supporters should march on the Capitol on January 6th when Congress is about to formalize Joe Biden's win. Man, if only he had actually done that. Trump is facing criminal charges for the same conduct. The Supreme Court in April will hear our oral arguments on his broad claim of presidential immunity. The ruling warned of the dangers of a patchwork of decisions around the country that could send elections into chaos if state officials had the freedom to determine who could appear on the ballot for president. Well, exactly. You have red states removing Biden for whatever acts of corruption he's committed. Or what if they removed Biden because they said he engaged in insurrection by stealing the bloody election? You have all the red states kicking him off the ballot, all the blue states kicking Trump off the ballot. It would be chaos, which should be obvious to any of these retarded people who thought that this was going to fly. The result, excuse me, the ruling said, the result could, be, could well be that a single candidate would be declared ineligible in some states, but not others, based on the same conduct. Obviously. Although the bottom line vote was unanimous, there were some divisions in the court. Yeah, well... The decision could insulate Trump from future controversy. Uh, ruling shuts the door on other potential means of federal enforcement. Yeah. Conservative Justice Amy Coney Barrett, however, agreed that the court went further than required. No, that's not a however. Sorry. But she did not join the liberal justice's opinion. Um, she just said she had disagreements of it. And yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's just a bunch of uninteresting nonsense passed in. I'm not going to go to the Supreme Court opinion itself because it's just not necessary. I think that was actually a decent summation for being NBC. So, in other news, let's go to the chat. This is a live show after all. So, why not just allow constitutional carry in New York City, says Florida Treasurer. <laughs> Instead, they just increase police and martial law state. Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, can't allow citizens to have guns in a police state. That would be crazy. Storm Hunter says, out of chaos, order. Ordo ab uh, New York City, test balloon for dystopian hell on steroids. Yep. There is a separate group of Chinese migrants moving alongside third world horde by the way of Darien Gap. I don't know what that means if you could expand upon that i'll look into it rocky what's up buddy brian from the west says uh multiculturalism is our greatest strength i agree 100 percent. magnolia madam good morning uh storm hunter says they want ai to police content and also create much of it yeah what a weird thing to do like nobody's seen the movie Terminator. i was talking to a young lady yesterday who has never seen the terminator or terminator 2 or anything like wow swastika a 5,000 year old symbol that means many different things to many cultured and peoples over millennia yeah well it only means one thing now and it's a threat of violence Good morning to Shovelhead. Garfield, but racist <laughs> early. Yeah, um, I've got a seminar starting in about 20 minutes. Um, it's been the past three days, so I'm not going to be here at the usual 3 p.m. Um, so I just wanted to do this early in the morning uh, because I've got a super important hearing tomorrow and um, just don't want to leave it off for tomorrow. Fulk Starke, top of the morning, buddy. All right. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, interview, covered an interview with Tucker. Oh, Tucker Carlson, but it didn't mention. I don't know what that means, buddy. Sorry. Um, Storm Hunter says allegedly they do not appear to be motivated by economic reasons and they are using a different encampment. It's not clear who's helping them move through that dangerous way. 
I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that when we're done. Can't wait to listen to Cantwell interview, says Draconian One. Thank you for mentioning that. I totally forgot to mention that. I was on uh, Chris Cantwell's show on Monday, The Radical Agenda, um, talking about the Rise Above Movement case in Los Angeles, the Charlottesville cases in Charlottesville, uh, and a case we have here in Orlando on kind of what we were talking about at the beginning of the show, Nazi flag waving, right? So, went on Cantwell, discussed that. Another big point to make is uh, go to AugustusInvictus.com. At the very bottom, you'll see you can join the email list. So I did send out a newsletter on Monday saying that I was going to be on the Radical Agenda. Um, so sign up for the email list so that you get those uh, announcements every week. So let's go back to the news. Florida has passed laws about uh, critical race theory and all this stuff. So let's just read the memo from the University of Florida. <laughs> um, from provost and senior vice president, blah, blah, blah. Subject. Compliance with BOG Regulation 9.016 on prohibited expenditures. Let me drink some coffee here from my lovely bookkeeper. Thank you. To comply with the Florida Board of Governors Regulation 9.016 on prohibited expenditures, the University of Florida has closed the office of the Chief Diversity Officer eliminated DEI positions and administrative appointments and halted DEI focused contracts with outside vendors. You remember that um, video of that thing with glasses and a beanie when they were announcing that Trump had won the election, like the screaming, <laughs> like this thing is on its knees in public, like in this crowd and screaming, no, you can imagine that that is what is going on with everybody reading this <laughs> from the from the provost at UF. Like, you're all fired. Sorry. Everybody that has a DEI position, uh, you're all gone. Sorry. Under the direction of UF Human Resources, university employees whose positions were eliminated will receive UF's standard 12 weeks of pay. These colleagues are allowed and encouraged to apply between now and Friday, April 19th, for expedited consideration for different positions currently posted with the university. UF Human Resources will work to fast-track the interview process and provide an answer on all applications within a 12-week window. So it's like you've popped a zit and all of that stuff just goes into different parts of your face, right? Like that is what's going on. You pop this boil and all the pus goes elsewhere. You, you know, the venom's going elsewhere. Like we're not actually, oh, we're not actually getting rid of you. We just got to get rid of, you know, your garbage classes. But we're going to put you in, I don't know, medieval literature. What, what do you want to study? And then you can spew all your vile critical race theory while you're talking about uh, Dante's Inferno. You can talk all about uh, gender theory while you're teaching, I don't know, Jane Austen. So don't panic. <clears throat> We're going to fast track you into a different position where you can just be sneakier about it. Additionally, the Office of the Chief Financial Officer will reallocate the approximately $5 million in funds previously reported to Tallahassee for DEI expenses, <laughs> including salaries and expenditures, into a faculty recruitment fund to be administered by the Office of the Provost. Finally, the University of Florida is and always will be unwavering in our commitment to universal human dignity as we educate students by thoughtfully engaging a wide range of ideas and views, we will continue to foster a community of trust and respect for every member of the Gator Nation. Thank you. The University of Florida is an elite institution because of our incredible faculty who are committed to teaching, discovery, and serving. Wow. What a memo. So, they're gone. Good riddance. Compare Florida's uh, ongoings or goings on with what has just happened in Britain. It's from the BBC. Samuel Malia, far right activist jailed after sticker campaign. That's right. He put up stickers and had Nazi sympathies. It's over for him. Two years this guy got for this. 
A far-right activist has been jailed after a judge branded him an anti-Semite with Nazi sympathies. Samuel Melia, 34, was found guilty earlier this year of inciting racial hatred after a series of stickering incidents between 2019 and 2021. Stickering incidents. Mm -mm -mm. This guy's a husband and a father, by the way. He's got at least a little kid. Saw a little kid. You're going to spend two years in prison for putting up stickers. Putting up stickers three years ago, mind you. This is between 2019 and 2021. Three years ago, he put up stickers and he's been sentenced to two years. Malia from Pudsey in West Yorkshire was sentenced to two years in prison at Leeds Crown Court on Friday. Judge Tom Bayliss said, quote, the publication of this kind of material is corrosive to our society, end quote. Malia was the head of the Telegram messenger group 100 Handers, a social media channel that generated, uh, generated racist and anti-immigration stickers that were printed off and displayed in public places. My God. It's basically the gunpowder plot all over again. Thank God they stopped these people before the worst could happen. What if people got offended? What if it changed immigration policy? My God. I saw a funny... Uh, thing yesterday. It's like this 2015 post on Reddit. And it was like, how fast do you think UK immigration policy would change if they found out that, you know, because at that time it was the migrant crisis, right? And all these Afghan uh, refugees, quote unquote, were coming into the UK. And they were just letting millions and millions and millions into Europe and the UK. And there was a post saying, imagine how fast immigration policy would change if these, you know, leftist women that are doing all this found out that it was uh, Ukrainian women coming in as refugees. And it had a picture of a cute Ukrainian girl. And then, sure enough, it, it juxtaposed this with modern headlines of, sorry, we can't take Ukrainians in the same number we took Afghans. We're just overloaded. <laughs> so, the stickers contained ethnic slurs about minority communities which displayed a deep-seated antipathy to those groups, the court heard. Can you imagine putting up a sticker that displayed a deep-seated antipathy? <laughs> the gall. I don't know why they're bothering with imprisoning him. They should just hang him for treason. It's not going along with the program. The court also heard Malia had an obsessive interest in Sir Oswald Mosley, who founded the British Union of Fascists in the 1930s, and that he was attempting to peddle the same anti-Semitism. We are, of course, not at all endorsing Sir Oswald Mosley, who wrote his autobiography, My Life, and uh, Robert uh, Skidelsky wrote the authoritative biography, but we're not pointing you to that at all. Melia had a poster of Hitler in his garage. This is the key paragraph here for me. It reminds you of what is going on here in American courts as well. This is just the new standard of prosecution. Melia had a poster of Hitler in his garage, a book by Mosley in his bedroom, and it was found that much of the material Hundred Handers published was xenophobic, nationalistic, and vitriolic. So this is what they do. They accuse you of a crime... They drag you through the court process. They put you on trial. And what do you see at trial? Not evidence of having actually committed a crime. God forbid. But evidence that you had engaged in crime think. This guy's got a poster of Hitler in his bedroom. The humanity. This guy has a book by Mosley in his bedroom. That means he thinks about it intimately. He's reading that sucker at night. He's reading it when he first wake up. He is Oswald Mosley all the time. Probably thinks he's going to be Oswald Mosley. And this guy is putting up stickers in our neighborhoods. Saying he wants these immigrants out. Just like Oswald Mosley. And saying the Jews are responsible for it. Just like Oswald Mosley. This guy's got to be stopped. You know what? We didn't imprison or execute Oswald Mosley. And that was clearly a mistake. 
did the same thing to James Fields. He's got memes of Hitler in his phone. Can you believe this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? He's got memes of Hitler that he shared the day of the Unite the Right incident. Memes of Hitler in his phone. Obviously, he murdered the woman. <laughs> Who shares memes of Hitler except murderers and terrorists? And who has a poster of Hitler in his garage and a book by Mosley in his bedroom except the guy who breaks the law? <laughs> Obviously, that's the real crime. Judge Bayliss said, quote, For the first time since the 1930s, a real risk of gross, potentially violent anti-Semitism is becoming normalized on our streets. It has been used before to tear at the heart of Western democracy. It must not be allowed to do so again. End quote. I will never be able to visit Britain. The home country, the fatherland, even for vacation. After police arrested Malia in April 2021, they searched his house and found a label printer and stickers with anti-immigration messages. It is a crime. Two years in prison for putting up stickers. It's just incredible. Skipping ahead a little bit, the judge told Malia, I am quite sure that your mindset is that of a racist and a white supremacist. You hold Nazi sympathies and you are an anti-Semite. End quote. That is the tenor of language that you see in movies about the Catholic Church burning people at the stake for heresy. That is the tenor of this speech from the judge. He's sentencing this man and saying, you are a heretic, and I'm going to put you in prison to set you straight. When you come out, you will be a reformed member of society, and you will no longer be an anti-Semite and a Nazi. This has the exact opposite effect, though, doesn't it? Because if he wasn't a Nazi before, he's sure as heck going to be one when he gets out. You separate the man from his wife and his child for two years for putting up stickers, and this somehow makes you not exactly what he has accused you of being. All that's going to do is, well, it's not the only thing it's going to do. It's going to cement his hatred, but it's also a red flag to everyone delegitimizing your entire system of government. And for anyone with a conscience, it's infuriating to see something like that. Speaking of which, let's see what's happening in Michigan. After these messages. So let's look at the, uh, there aren't many comments here, but uh, Aleph, the nemesis says, would I ever be able to treat you to lunch in Orlando? Phew, buddy, I'll always eat lunch. Not during Lent though. Can't eat till 3 p.m. But uh, after Lent, yeah, absolutely. To introduce a lawyer friend who is sympathetic to the cause and be a great networking opportunity as he has his pedigree and works all over the state. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, my email is in the uh, YouTube description. Let's do it. Glad I did read the comments. So, father of Michigan school shooter facing manslaughter trap. Why do you keep shaking your head at me? What? Are... Just reading the comments, girl. Father of Michigan school shooter facing manslaughter trial. You can come along too. You can you can be part of the networking meeting. Uh, a month after a Michigan woman was convicted of manslaughter in a school shooting carried out by her son, the boy's father faced trial for the same unusual charge. So let me just state that. Let me reword that so you catch what is going on here. A young man shot up his school. They put the mother on trial for manslaughter and convicted her. Let's go to that because there's dual articles here from Reuters. This one is from February 6th. I don't know how I was sleeping on this. I am just hearing about this now. But this is from article uh, February 6th, excuse me. Michigan school shooter's mother convicted of manslaughter. A Michigan jury on Tuesday, that is back in February, uh, convicted the mother of a teenager who fatally shot four classmates at a high school near Detroit of manslaughter. After prosecutors argued she bore responsibility because she and her husband gave their son a gun and ignored warning signs of violence. 
super concerning and should be super concerning to the liberals doing this as well because these as you can probably imagine are white parents of a white kid and they're obviously going after these conservative gun nuts who bought their son a gun and he took it to school and shot people and said you ignored warning signs you are actually responsible for these murders but it's just manslaughter for you by that same logic could you not charge every gangbanger in Chicago, all of their moms, all, well, all of their grandmas that they live with because they ignored warning signs and allowed all this violence to happen in gangland Chicago? If you're going to allow vicarious liability for parents, why would we not do that for the black kids who are shooting up people in record numbers? So this is... Uh, unbelievable, quite frankly. Let's look to... Oh, time to go. But I'm not going to. We're going to finish this. Let's look to... I am not a Michigan attorney. I have to disclaim that. And everything here is for entertainment purposes only. I'm not giving you legal advice. But Section 750.321 and 750.322 govern manslaughter in the state of Michigan. Looking at the elements. So the elements of a crime or any cause of action you're trying to establish, the elements are what you have to prove to get a conviction, right? So you have to prove all of these things to get a conviction of manslaughter in Michigan. One, that the defendant caused the death of the deceased victim, that the the deceased individual died as a result of the defendant's action. Two, that the defendant either intended to kill the victim intended to do great bodily harm to the victim, or created a situation where the risk of great bodily harm or death was very high, knowing that as a result of the defendant's actions, he or she knew that serious harm or death would likely result. Number three, that the defendant caused the death of the victim without justification or lawful excuse. So three, we can take right off the table that the defendant caused the death of the victim without justification or lawful excuse. Like, that's for self-defense or defense of others. Like, obviously, these parents did not have that kind of justification or lawful excuse for killing somebody. So three is kind of not part of our analysis here. What we really should be looking at is, did these people cause the death of these four kids at the school? Because they gave their son a handgun as a Christmas present. Uh, I just bought my son a BB gun. Like, he is seven. It might be, might be a little different. But if he, you know, goes around, sh- obviously, like, if he shot a car window out, I would offer to pay the thing. But, like, you're not going to hold somebody criminally responsible for something that someone of age does. This kid is a high schooler. This is a very novel uh, legal theory that the parents are responsible for murder. And it's obviously an, intercedi- an intervening cause. So to say that the parents are responsible for the death of these four kids because they bought their son a firearm is madness. They created a situation where the risk of great bodily harm or death was very high. It's an impossible standard for the prosecution to meet. And yet they did it. Because juries are famously retarded. That's like when they, uh, you know, prosecutors will say, well, a grand jury decided that they should be indicted. So? You routinely lie to grand juries. You hide evidence. And there's a famous proverb that grand jury will uh, indict a ham sandwich. Everybody knows it. A grand jury is nothing but a rubber stamp for prosecutors. Likewise, you get the right liberal jurisdiction and the right college town And you can have a jury eating out of the palm of your hand. As long as there's no country folk with these backwards right-wing ideas like, I don't know, personal responsibility. So the fact that parents in this place in Michigan can be found liable for the deaths of others because they bought their child a handgun, that is the issue. Who's going to take this up next time that somebody kills somebody else? And eventually this will make it to 
the rifle comp- the gun companies, right? There have already been lawsuits against the gun companies, uh, I think by the government of Mexico, as a matter of fact, uh, for the gun violence by the cartels. That might be a little different, assuming that the facts alleged are true, that these gun companies knew that it was cartels who were buying these guns, and they knew what they were going to use it for. Like, okay, that might be a valid argument. But to say that you give a child a handgun for Christmas and then uses it to kill people, and now you're responsible for that, is just nuts. We have an analog in, say, dram shop cases where a bartender knows that someone is drunk, right? And still gives them alcohol and lets them drive away, and then that person causes a crash because of a DUI. You can hold that bar responsible for that, at least civilly. But no one would say that the bartender is going to be put on trial for manslaughter because the other a hole wrecked his car into somebody. Like they're hold, held civilly liable. You can sue the dickens out of that bar, but the guy's not going to jail for it. But when it comes to guns, now we're saying these parents are going to go to prison for buying their son a handgun. That is what they're after. They do not want kids having guns, kids, teenagers. Like we used to go hunting in this country when we were nine years old, which is why I bought my kid a gun at seven. Like this is just, this is American tradition. Just like driving around in the parking lot with your son in your lap. So he's quote unquote driving the car when he's a little boy. Like, That's American tradition. And now they're going to put you in jail for child neglect or abuse because you're driving around a parking lot with a kid in your lap, letting him drive the car. Like Now you're going to be held liable for manslaughter because your son shot up a bunch of people with the gun you bought him. So that obviously is intended to have a chilling effect on any parent buying their child a firearm. Obviously, that's the entire point of this. So, oh, of course, we're late. It's 11.01. My seminar has already started. I've got to go. Um, yeah, but I'll uh, the nemesis. Please do uh, write me. Let's set it up because, you know, I, let's put it in the calendar, man, because I'm super just extremely busy. I guess let's just put it like that. Sometimes I miss things. If you write me right now while I'm in the seminar, I will put it in the calendar. Let's, uh, let's set it up. I'll treat you to dinner here in St. Augustine. Oh yeah. Draconian. Let's do it. Um, I'm actually gonna be driving through St. Augustine, not next week, but, uh, the week after. So hit me up, man. Emails in the uh, description there. Let's do it. Storm Hunter says, just another way to put fear into people. Yeah, all this, exactly. I love St. Augustine. Where do you... Well, I'm not going to get into all those details, but... <laughs> um, Zyrom Nero. So God bless you. God bless you, buddy. And God bless every one of us. Uh, I've got to go. I've got to go to this um, meeting. I think that's all the news. I think that's all the comments. I will see you all next week. Thanks, everybody.